Breakthroughs are these little happy accidents that happen in our lives. There's these strokes of luck and you're just like, yeah, I had a breakthrough. I'd love to have that again. I just don't know how to recreate it. But through years of working with these NBA players and NBA coaches, I've just studied like how do these people become so successful and putting this all together into a formula. Confidence plus cooperation plus service plus purpose. We talked about confidence earlier and understanding mm -hmm. it's not about results. It's about your self-awareness, figuring out who you are at the core first. The cooperation is figuring out the team around you. Yeah, have your support team, but also have your challenge team. The best leaders and the best people you want to be around will challenge and support you. Now it's the what. What are you actually doing? It's about service true, genuine service. Sure, go down, continue to help out the food bank. That's great service. But true service is about giving your time and energy when it's not convenient for you. I'm not saying I have it all figured out. Trust me, I do not. But I'm working at it. Today on the podcast, we have David Nurse, who um, is, and if I'm wrong about any of my information, David, please chime in and and tell me. But no problem. No problem. You, are, you are a former NBA player turned coach to the Brooklyn Nets, correct? Almost. I wanted to play in the NBA, play professionally overseas, but we can say I played in the NBA because that makes me sound a lot cooler. So yeah, you sound, you sound way cooler when you say that, actually. Yeah. You shouldn't have totally. corrected me. But, but, but you know why you're on the podcast? Because uh, you're one of the top mindset coaches for the NBA. Is that not at least accurate? That is accurate. Yes, you got that one. Perfect. And you've written two books. The first book was called Pivot and Go. And then your newest book is called Breakthrough. Yes. There it is. And, Got that book too. Whew, God, thank God. And I, and I, this is why I want to talk to you because I bet you would give my audience and myself some amazing mindset tools to break through to really kind of elevate and up our performances and everything. And um, I really am happy to have you on the podcast. Well, Jen, thank you very much. I appreciate it. I wish we would have been doing the Woodways treadmills, walking and talking. But to be honest, I might have got halfway through and passed out and got winded. So this is maybe a better way to start it off. I don't know. Something tells me that you're pretty athletic, given your background, um, given that fact, even though you were potentially maybe not an NBA player, but you were uh, somewhat of a professional basketball player. Uh, yeah. I, I think that you could probably walk at the one point. We usually walk at like one, 1. 1.5. Anyway, I think you can probably handle that. You can handle it. See, I, I, blame it on <laughs> height. I blame it on my parents' genes. I blame it on height and vertical leap was about two inches. So that's what, that's what I blame my non-NBA playing on. I was going to ask you, how tall are you? 6'2", which in the world of basketball is right. very small. Wow. Is that, so that's basically why you became a coach in the NBA versus a player in the NBA. Totally. So my whole life growing up was based on, I thought I was going to play in the NBA. And I grew up in this small middle of nowhere cornfields town in Iowa and not very athletic. And, you know, parents probably should have said, no, David, try this game golf or tennis. You don't have to have that much athleticism like that. But I was committed to playing the NBA. So every waking hour was literally me doing something basketball oriented. And I got to play college basketball division one and grinded my way to play overseas professionally. Sounds cool to say that you play in Europe and Australia, but it was more like the Will Ferrell semi-pro type of basketball. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I'm a joke of the league. So I'm up here in this, this second division in Spain. And I mean, I'm just pouring in all these two days film study. And I think I'm still making the NBA, but I'm the furthest thing from it. And, and I get cut from this team. So think about that. All your hopes and goals and dreams. And you get cut from this joke of a league. Basically, your face turned upside down and rubbed in the dirt. So I'm back on my parents recliner chair now in Kansas City, where they're living, feeling bad for myself, licking my wounds and about six months. And my mom would always say these inspirational, motivational quotes. And usually it was like, oh, man, whatever, in one ear, out the other, ear, I'm not paying attention, like all parent, parents probably feel. But this one <laughs> that stuck with me, she was doing dishes. I remember it vividly. I was sitting there kicked back in the chair. She said, David, when one door closes, four open in an entire beachfront patio overlooking the ocean. I was like, oh, wait, I thought it was one door, one door thing. What's this four doors and beachfront? What she was saying is that door closing on my plane in the NBA was actually to open up the door to coaching the NBA. Everything I poured into myself 
to be able to think I was going to play was actually to teach other players with more athleticism, seven foot height, and had this God given abilities to play in the NBA. So I made that pivot, hence that first book, making a small perspective shift. I didn't say, man, woe is me. My first 24 years of my life, I need to throw them away. No, it built me for something better. I didn't know that was coming, but it opened the door. So when one door closes in our life, a lot of people will say, oh, man, I'm out of a job. I don't know what to do. No, you just learned all those skills to lead you to something greater. So I made it my mission right then and there to coach in the NBA. But I had no connections. So we can dive into that, too, if you want to talk about how I got in there, which is a wild story in itself. I do want to hear that. Well, I have a couple comments and then I do want to hear that. But I really love that you said that because like my entire philosophy in life, uh, I even did a whole TED talk on this, actually, that I think we spoke about was, you know, if you just make attempts, you may not get that goal, but then it doesn't matter. It's about the process of making those attempts towards that goal, because if you don't get it, Usually another opportunity will present itself by you just mm-hmm. trying and make it doing that action that you otherwise would never even know, known of. Like in your head, you never even thought about being a basketball coach. You thought I'm yeah. working and persevering to be a player, a player, a player. But even though that didn't work, you ended up with something that, you know, that changed the tra- like the whole trajectory of your life. But it looks like in a really good way. Um, and the other thing I wanted to say was, if you say you don't have any connections, I thought I was going to actually say this. Isn't your uncle the Toronto Raptors head coach? Yeah, totally. But at the time, he was not in the NBA, nor was he close to the NBA. Really? No, there was no connections from that. No, he was just starting in the NBA D League. He literally had an upstart team. His story is incredible, which we could go on for. Tw- he basically is the epitome of you've heard the, the 10 years to become an overnight success. Of course. Yes. He's 27 years. He was a coach for 27 years before he even got an opportunity with the Toronto Raptors to be their head coach. Then he wins the NBA championship in his first year. And what do you think everybody says? Oh, he got so lucky. First year head coach. Right. No, and grinding in countries you don't even know play basketball. I was I was in England with him when he was taping players ankles before the game, popping popcorn at halftime. Like he put in that time, those 27 years of unseen hours. But the key is. He always saw himself as an NBA head coach. He had a picture of himself holding a trophy, like cut out and put on the fridge and all that because he was going to live in that instead of where a lot of us get caught up and like, well, you know what? When I get to this level, that's when I'll really put in the work or when I get to the No, you, you you treat yourself and you act like you are at that level, no matter where you're at. And eventually you'll get there. But if you don't, if he would have just said, man, you know what? Once I get that opportunity, NBA, that's when I'll really start coaching. I had never been there. That's amazing. I actually, I'm glad that you told me that. I didn't realize that that was such a grind for him. That's amazing. I mean, obviously the Toronto Raptors, I'm from Canada. So of course, you know, I have to say that. But then tell us about how you kind of grinded your way with no connections to be in this spot where, you know, basically coaching a major team. Yeah, totally. So you'll appreciate this is one of your things is, hey, take shots. And I'm all about planting seeds. Like, what is the worst that can happen? Just take shots, take shots, take shots. Calling it planting seeds, what we do with these taking actions, we're, we're planting seeds that, that we might not know when they're going to grow their fruit, but they will at some point. But if you don't take the shots, you have no opportunities. Right. So what I did was I hand wrote a letter to every NBA GM. And in that letter, I said something I liked about their organization and if I can serve them in any way. I did not say, hey, hire me. I'll outwork everybody. That's what everybody says. So think a little bit different than what everybody else does. I didn't get anything back for a month and a half. And I got a phone call from the GM of the Los Angeles Clippers at the time, Gary Sachs. And it was just a normal conversation, real brief. And at the end of it, he said, if if you're ever out in LA, look me up, we'll grab coffee. Basically, good luck with the rest of your life. (laughs) I took that as an opportunity though, Jen. I Spent all my money, stole some of my parents, booked a flight out to L.A. to act like I had a basketball camp that next week so I didn't look desperate. Now I, oh, I love my- that. Exactly. Wait, how old were you when you did this? How old were you? 24, right when I was done b- playing basketball. Okay. 24. All right. So, so I prepare my butt off for this meeting because right. I want to know the insides. And, out. and we have this great conversation. We hit it off. And Every NBA connection has stemmed, if you look to the root of it, from that 
that conversation with Gary Sachs. Gary becomes one of my closest friends. I live with him for six months when I moved out to LA. He was a groomsman in my wedding. He is like one of my best friends in the world just because I took that chance. So think about that in your own life, people listening. Like you want to take a chance, but we're often scared of what the result will be because we don't know what the result will be. We think, oh yeah, well, we won't get anything back or we'll get rejected or we'll fail. So what? You're at the same exact spot if you don't take that chance. Totally so true. You're playing with house money. That's the way I see it on all the time. Like I will reach out to anybody because it doesn't matter. Everybody's a person. Nobody like in, in these people at the highest level that you've seen that you've been around or these NBA players, what they want is people to actually treat them like people, not yeah, be absolutely and taking and taking. So anyways, I got that relationship with Gary. He introduces me to people throughout the way, throughout my journey, but I wasn't just waiting around. I wasn't like, well, Gary, hook me up with that person. Hook me, hook me up with them. No, I had to take action. It's not just going to happen. So I created these custom basketballs with this line down the middle so you could see the shooting rotation on it, the spin. And I had them made from, from China with very cheap, terrible leather. Don't ever recommend it. Sent out to the <laughs> Oakland Seaport. I drive 29 hours, put the balls in my car. I spend the next five years driving around the country, living in, in my car. I was sleeping in well lit. Walmart parking lots and friends' couches who didn't even really know I was their friends. It's just doing a basketball camp basically for anybody that would take me in. And I loved it. I mean, it sounds like a grind, but I loved that journey. And what I do you mean a do basketball camp? Like, give me an example. So you show up in somewhere. Yeah. And, hey, and what does that mean? So I would make a connection with a high school team or a middle okay. school team. I'm like, hey, look, I'll teach your players how to shoot. That was my expertise. I, I decided if I'm going to make it in the NBA – I can't just say I'm going to outwork everybody. I don't have connections. Like I've got to stand out. And it's the whole Hollywood thing too. If you act desperate and try to go for them, they'll never want you. So I didn't want, I wouldn't want to act desperate and go for the NBA. I wanted to build myself up as the best shooting coach in the world. And they would come to me. So I did camp after camp after camp. I knocked on doors and I'd sent emails and made phone calls to do these basketball camps and they start growing and I get connections and I love building relationships. So all in the meantime, I'm going out to this NBA summer league where all the teams come in the summertime and I'm getting business cards and I'm staying connected and I'm cultivating these relationships. And that's a big point too, Jen. I, we could talk about that. The, the, the art of networking, quote unquote networking, which is a very dirty term because I've learned so much doing it the wrong way that I've figured out the connection calculator, how to cultivate and build true genuine relationships. And that is everything for your personal growth. So anyways, I'm doing no, all this. No, no, no. That's totally true. And I want to talk about that after you finish your story. I think it's, totally. it's by the way, it's the crux of all of this, right? All of it. Because yeah. if you, if you, if you're bad at networking, uh, and you're not able to like develop true connections with people, good luck to you. You have to be able to understand that. So it may be like a dirty word to some people because like, oh, it sounds like you're Machiavellian or whatever else, but it's not. But it's legit what you have to be doing. Yeah, totally. Yeah. But I like to flip it from like if people look at networking, you think of the LinkedIn, you think of I'm going to hit somebody up versus the building a genuine relationship and a connection, which is going to work for a lifetime. Networking can be just quick hits, but you don't build this relationship mm -hmm. like with you. I want to build a long-term friendship where years from now we're talking to each other. I'm hitting you with ideas and, and so on. Like I don't like just, just one-offs and, and feeling like both sides got used. And that's why a lot of people will do this connecting. So yeah, let's I, get, agree. I definitely want to get into, I want to tell you some stories of where I've learned how to not do it to learn the correct way. But fast forward six years, I'm in Melbourne, Australia. I'm doing a basketball camp. I get an email when I wake up from the Brooklyn Nets. It says Brooklyn Nets shooting coach. I knew nobody from the Nets, so I thought it was spam. I opened the email. <laughs> Next week, I'm the Brooklyn Nets shooting coach. It was a relationship that Gary had known through a Nike guy, through another guy, and so on. So I finally made it. But that's how you got it? How many, how, I years, got it. how many years after that initial meeting with Gary did that happen? I think it was five and a half total. Okay. Five, so you were out yeah, there five and, five and a half years, like grinding doing these uh, basketball camps around the world, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it. I, I loved it because I got to see the world and I was young and I was doing it on my own. But looking back on it, it's like, wow, that was like, I'll tell my wife of some situations I was in, like flying into Uganda or I mean, staying out of, staying on this person's couch who was a large, it was a large knife butcher in Australia when I was doing a camp out there. 
and I only knew their cousin. So I didn't know this guy at all. Literally in his kitchen, there were these massive, massive knives. Looking back on it, I'm like, oh my wow, I'm so lucky I survived. <laughs> part of the journey. That's amazing. Okay, so give me some stories then of how not to network and how what you've learned and yeah. what the art, in your opinion, of how to really make true connections for networking. For sure. So going on with the next story. Okay, so we have this this great turnaround season. We go from 28th in the league to second in three-point percentage. And I'm getting all this pub and this media as this hot up and coming young coach. The GM's telling me, hey, we want to do a three year deal. We want to lock you down. So, hey, I thought I was in like this is what my dream was. Now I was in for life. I finally made it. So the Nets get a new coach at the end of the season. Now, I went out to Las Vegas Summer League and I got so many coaches connections and I was really good at cultivating. I was really good to stay in touch, check in on them, help them, serve them in any way that I could. There was this one guy I had a Starbucks meeting with. And he had asked me to help one of his players get to the Philippines to a league down there. And I had connections in the Philippines, so I could have done it. And I completely forgot. Like it, it slipped my mind. I didn't take note of it. I didn't even stay in contact with this guy. Totally, totally spaced. Did a horrible job at it. And when they announced the hiring for the Brooklyn Nets, this guy was the assistant for the Atlanta Hawks at the time. Guess who got that head coaching job? <laughs> that guy. So right when he got it, it was like my stomach dropped. I was like, oh, no, I am in big trouble. And I got fired. I got, yeah. So that's all how that you got was, fired? That's how I got fired. The new coach came in. And th that moment, he was like, yep, yep bringing on my own staff. So, but once again, you know what? I'm grateful that that happened. That was a door closing for four more opening. I'd have still been in Brooklyn being a shooting coach or some other way being an assistant coach. And I've had opportunities to get back in the NBA, but it's not my it's not my calling. I got to come out here to L.A. and train all these top NBA players on court mindset, write books, speak, met my amazing way cooler than me wife. None of that happens if I'm still in Brooklyn. So absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. It, that's a great story. But I mean, that was actually more like like a mistake, like that happens to people, right? Like sometimes you're just busy and things just slip your mind and it just happens. That that wasn't a bad, bad networking story. That was more just like, oh shit. I, 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 it's the power of like, you actually have to cultivate them. Other people aren't going to do that for you. You have to be the one that stays in touch. So here's another one. So the, the MVP last year, Giannis Antetokounmpo, okay, this amazing player for the Milwaukee Bucks. A couple of years ago, he started becoming this phenomenal player. Like he was from Greece. He was an unknown player becoming this stud. And I see it. I'm like, dude, I can help this guy. Like if I can get with Giannis and be the guy that helps him shoot it, I'll be in lifetime any client I ever want. So I knew his agent. Me and his agent went back for like two years ago. I was training one of his players. I hadn't talked to his agent for two years. My text message to his agent was, hey, Hope you're doing great. I would love to help Giannis take his game to the next level and be an all-star. Can I work with him? This guy responds to me, David, hey, I love you, man. But this is the way that you contact me after two years? Sorry. Like, I, I was just asking. I was trying to take. He had this great client. And instead of staying in touch with him or even be like, man, how can I help you? Is there anything I can do for you? I went straight for the ask. Yeah. Terrible move. Obviously did not get to work with him. Since we've kind of repaired the relationship, but it's still like a little standoffish by his part. No, I, I, I totally, this like, it totally resonates with me. I, I really do, uh, I really do agree and, uh, with everything that you're saying. And it's like the strict, because people feel then used when you do it that way. It's about cultivating true, really. And I talk about this too, about real, real connections and relationships. So, then let's talk about the art of networking. Give me what you've, how, from all those examples that you've learned, how do you walk me through now what you would do or what other people can learn from this and what they can do instead? So here's what I do. If I want to reach out to somebody that let's say they're at a higher echelon and I want to reach out to them and become friends with them. So Instagram is the best way to connect with people. Everybody By the way, you reach, that's what you did with me. You reached out to me I on Instagram. Probably. I've met a lot of my very good friends off direct messages from Instagram. And you can say that sounds crazy or not, but that is the way most people, majority will check their direct messages. It's just how it is. People say they don't, but they actually do. But in that message, 
if you go back and look at it, I would not have said, hey, Jen, can I pick your brain? Can I get 15 minutes of your time so that you can teach me everything that you've done? Like, I'll get messages like that all the time. Like, hey, can I pick your brain? Hey, how did you get to where you are? Why? Like, I don't have that time. Time is the most valuable asset. Literally, time is money. And I'm not going to give it to some random stranger. But if you reach out to me and you say, David, man, I love this book. It's life changing. In chapter seven, I read this and this. I shared it with my wife and kids. Now we're doing a daily read on it every single day. You have impacted my life so much. I just wanted to let you know how much you mean to me. I'm cheering for you. I am in your corner. That's a little bit different than saying, hey, can I pick your brain? Now, this guy on the inside could have been thinking, man, I hope he responds. I'd love to become a friend with him, but I'm going to respond to that. Like if people pour into me, just like I'll do, I'll pour into other people and I'll encourage them, genuinely encourage them. I'm not sending copy paste messages. It's going to be legitimate messages on what they're doing, something that they're passionate about, whether it's like we put a lot of work into our books. We put a lot of work into our podcasts the stuff that we create, if you compliment somebody in that, like they're going to take more like, oh, this person really actually cares. Now you also got to know like, hey, they might not get back to you. That's totally okay. It's not the right time. Like there's certain time, like I believe in God's timing, like if it's meant to happen, God will make it happen. You don't have to worry about it. And you do not a week later, or especially a couple of days later, be like, yo, hey, did you get my message? Like, no, yeah, I got your message and I didn't respond to it because it's not the first pr- most important thing on my plate. Sorry. <laughs> like, that'll turn up. Wait, you got to wait at least at least two and a half weeks before you send a reminder or something. But also in every message you send to connect, you say, hey, no pressure. Do not feel like any pressure at all that you have to connect. Totally cool. Like take the pressure off them. And when you take the pressure off somebody, they have a general inclination, inclination that they actually want to help. So that's a few of the tools, but you also then, it's so important too, like when you connect people together, like Jen, if I connect you to somebody, I am not going to connect you to somebody who just started a podcast, somebody who is, you might hate to say this, but as someone that's at a different level, because it just doesn't make sense for you, not in a conceited way, but you've put a ton into what you've built. You put a ton into what you do. So people have to put in those reps to be able to get up there. So you have to connect people on the certain levels. And I'm going to ask you first every single time, hey, do you want me to connect you to X so-and-so? I'm never going to just say, hey, meet Jen. Like now I put something on your plate. Now you feel obligated that you have to get back to them. Even if it's a great connection, it's still a mis- misstep on my, my part. So always ask permission first. Yeah, that's a good point. But you know, you, you know it's funny because um, I agree with a lot, everything. That, again, you and I are very... Uh, we, we, we think very similarly for sure, because I think that when people, when you feel like it's cookie cutter or like, it's like one of those like mass type of emails, no one wants to respond. Like you, you can tell the difference if someone is being genuine and it's kind of curated for you versus just mass. Right. And then I always will respond if it, I feel like there's like, they put effort in, right. There's yeah. a different the mm-hmm. effort. But the question, right? The question then is, and then what? So then you connect, let's say, let's say if you get the connection and then, then what? How do you maintain? A lot of times it's not so much just the, you know, you, you got it. Okay. Then what's the, now you have it. Once after you have it, how do you maintain the relationship? Great question. Now it'd be, what is my gift to you? So what do you, what can I provide to you that will help you? So maybe it's relationships. Maybe, hey, hey Jen, I got these friends in my lad, John Gordon, Max Lugavere. Like, I would love to put them in touch with you. I'm sure you guys would do a great podcast. Now, this is something you might want. You're like, oh, I don't have those connections. Okay. Now I become the connector. People that get, when you connect people together, they never forget, or they shouldn't, the person that connected them. So you might not have that as your ammo. It could be something like when I was connecting with people like, hey, I, well, especially when I was reaching out and wanting products and sponsors, hey, my NBA player, make, I'll have them use it. And if they like it, you know, I'll have them reach out to you just in great ways for me to be able to get yes. <laughs> so that would give that I could use. But you have to figure out what your give is. Maybe you're a genius behind the camera and you can cut up this killer speaking clip. That's your give. People want that. Maybe you have 
really, really smart with email marketing. Like people need that. So if anybody out there knows email, I need that. (laughs) So if you had, if you hit me like, dude, I know how to do this. Like I can build huge email newsletters lists. I'm going to get in touch with you and I'm probably going to become your friend because you are giving me this thing. So absolutely. It, it, it does. I totally yeah. understand. And I totally agree with you. Like it can't be like cut and pay. like, just because I, that's my like superpower is like being a connector. Doesn't mean that's your superpower. You just have to figure out what yours is. But a lot of people don't even know they have a superpower or they don't have the confidence to even send an email or, or a DM, like you said. Right. So then let's take one step back. Okay, because I think you talk about this a lot, I think, in Pivot and Go about confidence. I mean, I think right off the bat, obviously, you have confidence, you're confident enough and you already have that mindset of like, what's the worst that can happen? You know, I don't care if I'm rejected. I don't care if I fail. I'll just you have that ability to get up and and try again, you know, pivot and go, let's say. (laughs) Um, How how do you tell people in both in for your in your book in general What's the best way to build confidence to actually not feel and fear fear? It's a great point. And there's so many ways to do it. And you just got to pick which way works for you. So I'll go through some different ways. But first of all, the foundation all starts with understanding that your confidence does not does not lie in your results, does not lie in your resume or like. It is completely on who you are, your true self-awareness. So if I strip everything away from what you do, if you take your business title, you take all that and throw it away, who are you? Are you a loving, caring person? Uh, Do you pour into your spouse, your kids? Are you the best Sunday morning pancake maker? Like, who are you outside of what's your business title? So that is very, very important. Before we start with why, the Simon Sinek famous thing, you have to start with who and know your foundation. Once you do, you can build on there. So there's ways to build confidence. I have a seven steps to unshakable confidence that I'll do with in my coaching groups and with NBA players. And one, I'll just go through the list. Confidence through comparison. People will think that's a bad thing. It's actually a great thing. So you pick somebody who you can see yourself being like, and then you just study them, follow their footsteps. Somebody's already been to the point that you want to get to. What did they do to get there? They didn't just wake up born there. They had to go through it all. Figure out what that is. Try to reach out to them. Try to connect with them. Even if you can't, build your table of people you can have this, this virtual dinner with all the time. Like say, I want to I want to be like Tony Robbins. I want to be like Mr. Rogers. I want to be like Anthony Bourdain. Let's say I put those guys around my table. I want to be a mixture of those guys. I'm going to learn from each one of them. What did they do? Because it's not a, it's not a oh, well, that's for the lucky few. Like, why me? No, it's a why not me? Like, somebody's got to do it. It can be you. And so compare yourself to somebody like that. Confidence through strength focus. Figure out what your God-given ability is, what your strength is. Like NBA players, if you're good at everything, you're not playing in the NBA. But if you're great at one thing, like a player that I grew up with, Kyle Korver, was one of the best three-point shooters in NBA history because he decided, you know what, I'm going to stop focusing on all my weaknesses and I'm just going to practice, practice, practice threes. So that's how he had made over $100 million in the NBA. So think about what your strength focus is. I love that. First of all, I love that because people, I I believe that too. And the the people who kind of like uh, go at it with me, because they're like, you still have to, you know, I believe that you don't have to be, it's better to be a master of one than a jack of all trades. Jack of all trades, you get, you get watered down, right? Because, and then you never shine. But to be able to be, to be able to pick that one strength and go all in on that, that's how you really kind of take it to, that's how you become a star, so to speak, and get known for one thing, a niche. Yeah, totally. Like I'm good at speaking and I'm good at writing. I am not going to be Mr. The emails. I'm not going to be Mr. Cut up film. I'm not going to be handyman. Like I know I'm not good at that, but I'm Aren't you good find- at shooting. Yeah, that I'm good at. So if we're playing basketball, say. <laughs> but I mean, that's not what I'm not going out and shooting thousands of shots anymore because that's not my goal. So right. that was my one thing that I practiced when that was my goal. But You got to think of yourself of the Formula One racer like that racer is not going to stop, do the pit with the tires, put the fuel in. Like you (laughs) find people around you that are part of your crew to make yourself just solely focused on what you do so well. So some other things, ways to like kick it right into gear when you don't feel you have it. Personal highlight reel, which I call the highlight reel 2.0. So at some point in your life, you had a moment when you were just killing it, whether it's a basketball player, their best game, a speaker on stage, making a business deal, 
stay home mom, just the best dinner you ever made, whatever it is, you've had that moment. So you can recreate that moment in your mind. Most people will think, well, that was a stroke of luck. No, you actually did it. So there's proof that you can do it again. So literally, either you have the clips you can watch or you visualize yourself, see yourself going through that moment and more bonus points if you can actually feel it. If you can put some sense and some smells to that time, that moment, smell is th the three times more powerful than any other sense that we have. So like if you walked in and you had this, briefcase and it smelled like leather or this coffee you were drinking when you were doing it, like tie those to it, the feeling, everything. And watch this daily. Do this when you wake up, visualize your personal highlight reel. Because if you do it once, okay, that's great. If you brush your teeth once, they're not going to be white for a lifetime. Do this. These mental skills, these mental habits are meant to be things that you do consistently. It's just like a basketball player. If they work on their shot day after day, they build muscle memory. But that's that's tangible muscle memory we can see. That's what people think like, oh, well, I'm in working out so I can see my body change. And that's tangible muscle memory. But the more important part is the mental muscle memory where you don't actually see. But it works the same way day after day. There's other things that I'll use, like the Q word, like the movie Inception, where the top is spinning and they see it. Boom, it kicks them back into a level of the dream. You pick a word, whatever it is. Mine's unshakable. If I'm on stage and I've done this, I've been in talks with like these big CEOs in this intense room and I see this guy doodling, literally drawing like stick figure pictures while I'm just starting off my talk. So I'm like, oh my gosh, am I losing the room? And I'll say unshakable, unshakable, unshakable. It'll kick me back and be like, I'm okay. Like it's fine. And you can use, so pick your keyword, what that'll be. But the biggest one of all, honestly, is like understanding what you stand for and knowing that like you have a you have a faith and belief in something bigger than that moment alone. And for me, it's my faith in God. And so I know if I walk onto a stage and I trip and I fall and I forget every single word, I don't care. One, it's going to make a better story for another talk later on. But two, I've got God and I've got my smoking hot wife. I don't need anything else. <laughs> I love that. That's great. That is, that's great. Those are great tips, actually. You said one that you said in the, the first one you said was, comparing. So who do you compare yourself to for the confidence builder that you would so, like to be like? Yeah. In the basketball realm, I compared myself to the best shooting coach, Chip England. So I, I studied him. I tried to write him. I wrote him letters. I tried to call him. I drove out to Las Vegas to actually get the chance to meet him, just the chance to meet him. And he saw all that I was putting in and he gave me some advice, gave me some great advice. So I put a ton of work into meeting him, comparing myself to him. Now it is, it is a mixture. It's Tony Robbins. It's a John Maxwell. It's a Mr. Rogers, who I obviously can't meet. It's an Anthony Bourdain. Like those type of people. I'm like, okay, I'm going to study everything that these guys do. Because I know they had to be at this point sometime in their life. Like if they got there, why can't I? So I'll just, I'm a nut for studying all high performers to see what their story was, what their daily habits are, and stealing from them. Because I believe like we are, we are an original but we are never an original. We are like a smoothie. We have these different ingredients. Like I take an ingredient from something I love about you or something from friend John Gordon and I'll throw them all in this blender. These people I learn from blend it up. And then I put my own little spices, granola, cacao nibs on top <laughs> to add my own little flavor. So we're a mixture of everybody. An uncommon original is what I call it. No, I love that. Um, so, okay. So you've said a lot of uh, good things here. So I was going to we didn't really talk so much about your book yet, but we did it. And we did, we did and we didn't really, but these are all great. The, the, all this information, what I love about it, it's very practical and tangible. And that's what this podcast is about. And this is the kind of guest that you're the kind of guest that I like to have, because it's that either, these are like little nuggets that are really simple for people to really integrate into their lives and tweak, yeah. right? It's not so, this is not daunting information. Um, but I wanted to ask you about something that we, that you said about habits. What are your daily habits? Do you, who did you, so you took a, you basically, it's in a smoothie of all these people you mentioned. Mm -hmm. And so give me a day in the life of what, what kind of habits do you do to kind of keep you on point that you've kind of tried and figured out yeah. works the best. Totally. So right now, and I'll keep sharpening them. Like they're not yeah. always going to stay the same. I think one important thing for people to understand is habits are, help, are meant to help you. They're not meant to inhibit you and prohibit you as being like 
if I didn't hit this or if I didn't get my workout in, like my whole day is thrown off. No, like then you fall death to the sword of habits. Like these are just meant to help you. So mine are when I wake up. What time? I, I, need, de- I need details, David. I don't like this. Like, I like waking up early, but it just depends. My wife's more of a night owl. So if I'm staying up later with her, if she needs to talk about something or we're watching a show, like I'll stay up a little bit later. Ideal world, I'm going to bed at like nine and I'm up at five. But usually it's more like 1030 and I'm up at 630. Okay. So I wake up and I walk by a mirror. So when I brush my teeth in the teeth in the morning, I do this thing called the foggy mirror where when we wake up, we always have self-doubt. We have 50,000 self-talk thoughts daily, 80% of them on average. I know we all know this are negative. So I stand there in the mirror and I do this action where I'm wiping away, acting like the mirror is foggy, wiping it away. I do this every day. And this just reminds myself, I don't have to live in negativity or self-doubt. I can wipe it away. I can live in the self-confidence of who I am. So that action brings a lot of power for me in just that reminder, okay, God's made me to be something great, not average, great. Then I hop in a three minute ice cold shower. This is for two purposes. You know the health benefits of it for the cold thermogenesis, but also it's just to wake me up. And it's a way to be like, okay, I can go through this sucky stage that I hate getting into that ice cold shower. If I can get through this, I can get through anything else in the day. It's kind of like a mental dictatorship type of tool. I'll go upstairs. I put on my praise and worship music. I just want it nice and calm. My phone is on airplane mode. Unless I'm on the road, then I'll have it on. So in case my wife needs something, but if not, I've got it on airplane mode. I don't want the text messages, the emails, the WhatsApp, the line, the WeChat, all from all over the world coming in. That that can wait. I'll have my praise and worship music on. I'll make my beautiful Chemex made coffee. I love the process and the what smell. What kind of coffee? of coffee? Well, the Chemex machine. So it's a pour. It's like you're pouring it into the Chemex. It's type of uh, type of way that you make coffee. Yeah, no, it sounds good. I'm, I'm a huge coffee person. That's why I didn't, but the Chemex is that like a brand or is that like a no, type? No, it's like a. There's pour over. There's, I mean, there's a Keurig thing. It's a, it's a Chemex. If you just look it up and you see it, you just how do you spell like it? I'm gonna look it up. C H E M E X Chemex. Okay, keep. Going. I didn't mean process. to. In, okay, I didn't mean to uh, inter- no. interrupt you. Okay, Go I would have done the same. If I, if you say something about coffee that I don't know, I'm gonna interrupt <laughs> you. I love coffee. I'm a nut for it. So that's Me why too. I would always be like, hey, I'm going to do this coffee detox. I'm going to do decaf because my body needs it. No, you're, you're, then your brain's going to hurt for a week and you'll be unproductive. I don't want that. Exactly. You know, uh, you're, I'm with you 100 percent. I can't do it. It's too, it's too much of a well, And also, I don't want to deprive myself of the one of the things I love the most. Totally. I wake up excited for that. So no, that not happening. A hundred percent. OK, so you make your <laughs> what do you put in your coffee? Do you put like half and half? Do you put milk? Do you put sugar? Yeah. I do stevia. Stevia is one of God's greatest gifts ever. I do that too. I pray that it doesn't come back long term and say that it's unhealthy because I use an unhealthy amount of stevia in everything that I drink. So I love it. Okay. So then I go into (laughs) like, I'll spend five minutes just quiet. It's it's really hard for me to just sit quietly. Like I'm not a meditator and and power, like kudos to if you are, but for people who say they meditate for an hour in the morning, hour at night, like what do you like? What are you doing with your day? How do you have so much time? Number one, and how do you have so much attention? Like my mind's thinking, I'm like a, like my puppy or something. I'm thinking about a bird flying out the window. So I try to stay five minutes totally. and just let God talk to me during that time. And then I'll have a devotional reading and a short reading out of the Bible that I do. And I'll journal. I write down any joy that I had from the day before. So it can be the smallest little joy, like me and. My wife had this great ice cream the other night. I'd write that down. So tallying those little joys that I have. And I'll do something called the big three. It's one one of the most game changing things for me. I'll text message or video message three people who maybe I haven't talked to for a while, just encouraging them just saying, you know what? I'm thinking of you in my morning time. I hope you're doing well, cheering you on. Let me know if there's anything I can ever do for you. I'm in your corner, something like that. And the responses I've got from it have been literally life changing to some point. But man, you don't know how much I needed this at this time. I was so down. Thank you so much. Like we don't know what people are going through. We just don't. Everybody puts on a face, puts on a front. So if you can be that person that encourages others, like it could literally change their life. And you got to understand, like most people are not going to do that to you. Very, very rare for you to do that for me, but I'll always do that three people a day. And then I'll usually go into a workout unless I have an early call uh, from the East Coast, which if you live on the East Coast, like, what are you doing? Like, come to the West <laughs> So I'll get a workout in and then I'm, I'm in my zone from there. What kind of the workout work- do you do? I just lift. I mean, there'd be, if there's... I'll play tennis if someone wants to play tennis, but I'm I'm pretty much I'll just just lift weights. I'm not 
I'm not killing it with a CrossFit or definitely not running a marathon. Anybody that says that to, you know what? I, I don't know if I trust people who don't like coffee and who want to run marathons. I don't know if I can trust <laughs> just saying that. I don't know. I, I'm with you. I should, I never understood. Like people always ask me like, Oh, have you run a marathon? They assume that I have because I'm in the fitness space. And I'm like, I would, I would refuse. I do refuse to do that because the, the, the strain and the, and the, what you're doing to your, the pounding that you're doing to your body, like you just break it. Like you're just like asking for an injury later on. Like, I just don't want to, I like to be active so much that I don't want to have that chance of, of, of ruining it later on. You know what I mean? Or getting, or getting mm-hmm. hurt. I never understood it. I never understood why people love marathons. <laughs> it just doesn't make yeah. any sense to me. How about those ultra marathoners? That's another one altogether. Oh, crazy. Yeah. You can, yeah. Everybody else, you can go have those. Crazy. Okay. So you, you said coffee and then you work out. When do you eat? Are you an intermittent fasting person? Because you did drink mm-hmm. coffee. Okay. So you eat breakfast. No. God bless you. I'll eat, breakfast. I'll eat something small before I work out. Then I'll eat breakfast. Big fan of food. Like I'm not going to, uh, I mean, if, I guess there's sometimes I used to do intermittent fasting all the time and it like long term, it killed my hormones and it like testosterone was low. And like, I thought I had to just always be in a deficit and like, it's just dumb. I didn't know. And finally I've learned and I've got around great people like, dude, like stop doing that. You're literally killing your body. What are you doing? You know, it's funny that you say that. Cause that's like, that's kind of how I, I, I it's not for me. Um, but I will tell you, I feel like when I ask these questions about what are people's habits, the number one habit I always hear now is they do intermittent fasting and that it's like great for your, you know, for, uh, for growth, for like uh, building growth hormone and for uh, apophagy, for this, for that. And I just don't under, it just does not make sense. It does not work for me. I, I feel like it's mm-hmm. such a deprived way of living because I love breakfast. I love coffee. Yeah, breakfast. I love this stuff. I think a lot of people will just say it and they'll get so on in on their kick, like people that just promote carnival, like that's the way to live. No, yes. it's just, become, it's literally just become their thing. So they feel like they have to promote that or, oh, I'm the fasting guy. So I'm going to do five day fast. I'm sure I'm, I'm guessing there's some benefits, but there's also probably long term negative things that people don't talk about. I know for me, I intermittent fasted for seven years straight because I thought that was a thing. I checked my testosterone when I got married. Let's just say it was like an 85 year old man. So I'm just saying, be careful. You don't know. Like you should always check your blood levels and know where they're at. Know what works for you. Don't just listen to the guy who's been doing carnivore for two years and it acts like he's the expert and's on every podcast and literally doesn't know what he's talking about. Just be careful who you listen to. No, I know. Know your know your uh, resources. But I've had a million of these doctors on. I mean, so many of these fasting people who like who said there's so much research, proven research on the benefits of fasting, like what they're getting for like in terms of their mental, like focus and being alert to the, the, how to, how they really actually are burning fat instead of burning whatever. I mean, it goes on and on and on. And I agree with you. I think everybody's different. And I also think that in life, if you haven't noticed how for, uh, you know, 30, 20, 30 years ago, it was all about low fat. So we all would be having snack wells, those low fat, like just have a bowl of pasta. And it wasn't about having protein. It was all no fat, low fat, fat free. And then it, that was a whole fad for many, many, many years. And every doctor and every expert would say, that's the way to do it. And then there was a cycle and it changed. And then, and now, and then it was about the Atkins diet. And then there's always something that like comes up, like in, like, another fad or another like cycle where that becomes the way to live life. And then you only hear about, uh, about the after effects or maybe the negative effects years and years later. Right. Mm -hmm. So I I just think that, but people are looking a lot of times for like a quick fix for weight loss, or they're thinking that this would be the panacea for their longevity, you know, and sometimes it's just about like, People don't like it because it's not sexy, but just about moderation and just maybe just not eating a shit ton all the time and being careful <laughs> of what you're eating, right? But people don't want to hear that. It's too it's too plain Jane, you know. You know what doesn't you know what doesn't sell? And it's it, this is the number one thing. If you want to be successful, if you want to have a great body, if you want to be healthy, but it will not sell. It's called consistency. Yes. Literally, 
being consistent. It's boring, but it works. <laughs> yeah, I, tried, so hey, I tried keto and ate a bunch of fat and I got fat. It doesn't work. <laughs> it's long-term consistency. And well, want these, all, yeah. You know, also though, it's because unless you follow something to its exact T, which is almost impossible with these diets, you, it's, then it, it, it kicks you right out. Right. So like, for example, if you want to do this, you know, keto and you put like, or whatever it is at the time, intermittent fasting, but you're drinking coffee and you put like an ounce of cream in, oh my God, you're like, it's going to, you know what I mean? Like then you're out of, you're, you're jumped yourself right out of the, the, the apop, the autophagy thing and you're mine as well. I wrote my first book was called No Gym Required. And it was, uh, before it became, you know, a, a popular thing to, to like not go to the gym and just use your own body weight. And in my book, like no one wanted to read it because there was no sexy magic pill. It was basically be consistent, move every day, you know, push ups, you know, let's do a push up, let's do a squat, let's do a lunge. And it was this other book that was out at the same time that was like promising, you know, the moon and the stars. And that book, of course, did much better than mine. And totally. it's just like people, cause people don't, I think we understand that, uh, maybe logically, but our brains don't want to accept it. It's not like, you know what I mean? We want to go for that quick fix. We, we really need it to feel like we're totally. trying. Yeah. yeah, totally. And it's like, like, it's the four hour work week that Tim Ferriss created. I promise you, Tim Ferriss does not work for four hours a week. So, <laughs> I, 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 I know that. First of all, that's so true and so funny. I love that because it's about titling, right? Like it's about finding a title that's provocative that people are going to be like, oh yeah, I want that. I want to work for four hours. That guy probably, I think that guy does actually work like 18 hours a day, like crazy. For sure. Yeah, you know? totally. It's all clickbait. It's all clickbait because at the end of the day, you, you, you can't escape. If you want to be successful, it does take a lot of hard work. So that's what I have to say. Um, okay, wait, I've got a couple of questions for you. Um, other than what we, of course, just been speaking about for almost a, how long it's been, like almost an hour. <laughs> um, let's well, talk about here in just a bit. Just well, we listen, I have one question for you and then we can get out of here. How about that? Beautiful. That Ask okay. Away. okay. With it. Um, let's talk about this idea of greatness that you're talking about for break. Let's talk about breakthrough for one second. So we talk about Tell us how do we get a breakthrough? Let's just talk about that and then we can come back and do another podcast some other time. Beautiful. That's a great segue. So breakthroughs are, I mean, they're these little happy accidents that happen in our lives. There's these strokes of luck and you're just like, yeah, I had a breakthrough. I'd love to have that again. I just don't know how to recreate it. It's just how it is. It's a very abstract term. You can't grasp it. But through years of working with these NBA players and NBA coaches and working with CEOs and these high performing actors out here, like I've just studied, like, how do these people become so successful? What are they doing and putting this all together into a formula and the formula for making these little happy accidents into regularly occurring breakthroughs is confidence plus cooperation plus service plus purpose. That puts you into the breakthrough mode. Now, each one of these is slightly different than you think. So we talked about confidence earlier and understanding mm -hmm. it's not about results. It's about your self-awareness, figuring out who you are at the core first. The cooperation is figuring out the team around you. Now, you don't want to just put around people that are just going to tell you how great you are. You don't want to have the all just the yes men and, and you don't want to be the American Idol singer that your family says is the greatest ever and you actually suck. Like, yeah, have your support team. Everybody talks about, oh, I got to get my support team. That's cool. But also have your challenge team. The best leaders and the best people you want to be around will challenge and support you. It's a fine balance. And find people that aren't like you. I call it the misfits. I mean, Jesus comes down and who's he picked to be around? Kings? Does he pick to be around ruler? No, he gets a fisherman, a tax collector. He pits these misfits together to change the world. The 98 Chicago Bulls, best NBA team ever. Jordan, best scorer. Pippen, best sidekick. Steve Kerr, best shooter. Dennis Rodman, best crazy man where you don't know what color hair he's going to show up with or if he's going to get kicked out of the game. Misfits surrounding yourself with different people was like your strength, their strength, their strength. It's a compliments wish list to make an ultimate culture. So you know yourself, you know your team. This is the who plus the where. Where, where is your team? Cooperation, who, who are you? Confidence. Now it's the what, what are you actually doing? And if you're doing it for yourself, 
if you're like, hey, I want to make a lot of money and I'm going to be really happy because I have a big bank account or check me out. I got a million followers. Oh, I'm happy. Never happens. No one on their deathbed said, I made a ton of money and I'm really happy because I used it all for myself. Nobody in the history of ever is content with that. Neither are you going to be. It's about service, true, genuine service. Sure, go down, continue to help out the food bank. That's great service. But true service is about giving your time and energy when it's not convenient for you, when it doesn't match up with your Google color coordinated schedule, when somebody needs you and you're on a miss, you've got this Zoom call, you've got this call, you've got this call, but hey, they need you to pour into them. Are you going to stop and give them your time? People need it. We don't, like we said, we don't know what people are going through. You could change somebody's life just through a spark of a word of somebody at the gas station or behind the counter at the grocery store. But if you're too much in a hurry and only concerned with yourself, you'll never be able to find out. I've had massive breakthroughs in living in the service mode. And I, like I got to meet, that's how I met Mark Cuban and became friends with Mark Cuban because I gave him shooting lessons. I didn't even know he was Mark Cuban. But that's not always going to be the case, obviously. And I'm admittedly not very good at this because like when I have a schedule, it's, oh, my God, hit this. I got to hit this. I got to hit this. So I'm not saying I have it all figured out. Trust me, I do not. But I'm working at it. Right. You just said now you're like, I got to go. I have to be somewhere else. So exactly. But but part of the service is to be, you know, answering the rest of my questions. Isn't that service? I know. What time is your next thing? I'm I'm just teasing you. What time is your next thing? Seven minutes ago. But oh. it's totally cool because I'm zoned in the moment. No, no, no. So, that's good. Let's go. No, listen. I think I actually think that I'm going to allow you to go because you gave us some great insight, some great you information. You want to hit the last point? You're going to leave. You're going to leave everybody hanging with the okay, purpose. Okay, fine. Go. I, listen. I was I was being serve. I was giving you some service oh, by saying, cool. listen. I was going to be like enough about what I, my needs are. You have to go. You have a yeah. call. But yeah. no, please go ahead. I'm here with you. And I am here in the moment and I am here with your audience. Thank you. So the fourth point is purpose. This is the why. And then now you got to understand it's not it's not necessarily about what you are doing. It's not, hey, I have to be a famous singer and then I'll be happy. That's my purpose. It's about who you are doing it for. So even if you're doing a job that you don't necessarily like, are you going to that job and you're this your kids are seeing you just grunging through walking and being in a bad mood every single day because it's not what you love or. Are you have putting on a smile and going there with a lot of energy and being the person who's giving high fives? And then you see your kids see you like, whoa, that's what that's what dad's like. That's what mom's like. like. It doesn't matter what you are doing, but it's who you are doing it for. But if you are really living in your true element where you're on purpose plus passion, when you put the passion in there, that equals mission. And I love it when people are obsessed when they're obsessed with what they do, whether it's a local coffee bean barista who's telling you, oh, this bean was roasted at 37 degrees Fahrenheit in the mountains of Nicaragua. I love that. I don't care if you're making a lot of money. If you're something you're passionate about, if you're the guy out in Scotland who is the dude that everybody goes to for the best cashmere sweater, he's sitting out there in the mountains. He's just doing all this wool kind of knitting and stuff, but he is the man because he's obsessed with it. I love that. That's so attractive. Yeah, I agree with you 100%. I think, I mean, like, why, if if God gives us a gift, why would you say, you know what? Mm, I don't think so. I'm worried about what Jimmy down the street says. He doesn't think I'm good at it. So I'm not going to do it. That's a slap in God's face. I think the greatest gratitude that we can give back is to fully pursue what our passion is. And if you're doing that passion for other people, then you are on mission to bring other people's joy. That's the breakthrough formula. That right. is okay. Well, I I want to ask: Have you always been this religious? It feels like you have like faith is a very big part of your life too, a very big part, like a habit, yeah. daily habit. Uh, how did you grow up? What was your? So I haven't been. No, I definitely haven't. Oh, you been. haven't. Okay. Like, and I mean, you could say re- like religious, but it's more of a mine is a relationship with Jesus. That's where I find my joy. That's where I find um, just the knowing knowledge that I don't have to do this life alone. Like it's all planned out for me. And I was never like that. I was extremely selfish and for me in college. And I was, Hey, where's the party at every, like that was who I was. And, and I started going to this thing called fuel. It's funny because a friend of mine on the team had just invited me to, it's called fuel. Is this, this, this a uh, Christian or just a little hangout and stuff like nothing like religion can be. Cause I grew up Catholic. That's religion. And that drove me the other way. People probably have the, a lot of the same experiences Yes or no, maybe, I don't know. But anyway, so I go to this thing called Fuel and I'm seeing these people, they're just, they're singing, they're high-fiving, they're just smiling. I'm like, 
what drug are they on? I literally said that. I was like, I want to get whatever they have. Are they drinking something? They got something like, I got to get that. So I keep going back because inside I'm waking up every like I'm the like if you want to say the epitome of big man on campus, I'm the basketball player, the stud in college, whatever. But I'd wake up empty like I didn't have that. I had a deeper desire for something. So I keep going back to this thing called fuel. I'm like, this is weird. People are giving me hugs and they're they're asking what they can. This is we asking what they can do for me. I don't like this. But then there was something that kept drawing me back, drawing me back. I was like, this is what joy is. This is what true joy is these people are have, are living for jesus and that's where they find their true joy i was like this is this is a no-brainer so for me it's it happened when i was 23 22 23 wow and so it's been with you you've been able to sustain and do this and be this way that was like a big that sounds to me like that was a major transitional or pivotal point for you in a way Totally huge. That's that's everything. And and in saying like I've been able to maintain and sustain, like it's a lifestyle. Like to me, like there's no and this is not me in any way saying like, hey, this is what you gotta do. Like it, it, it isn't, but like that's what I believe. And like it's it works I mean, for you. But that was your pivot and go. It really was. I mean, you pivoted yeah. toward you leaned in and pivoted in this way, and it's really kind of grounded. So, it seems to me that it's really grounded you and really help you kind of flourish because you've believed in something that was so much yeah. in your belief and bigger than you. Totally. And there's so much historical backing of it. Like when people say, well, Jesus was just a, a good dude, a good leader. No, there's thousands and thousands of articles and books and all this kind of stuff written on Jesus. There's seven written on Caesar, but yet everybody knows like, oh yeah, Caesar was this guy for sure. Seven compared to thousands. I just, I would challenge anybody to go read the book or watch The Case for Christ, where this guy who didn't believe at all tries to prove it all wrong and literally everything lines up. Like, it's crazy. You can write it off. You can say, hey, well, I like the universe. The universe is giving, what the hell does that mean? Like when people, I mean, it might be your belief and I'm not coming down on anybody about that. But if you say like, I'm believing in the universe, where is the backing of that? Where is it? So I would challenge you to do this type of research. And not saying you have to, you could come back and be like, no, this is the dumbest thing ever. Cool. But at least try. Yeah. Well, no, I was just, like I said, I was only really mostly asking because you've kind of called back to it and mentioned it so many different times that I felt like that was kind of where you're, you're you, you got a lot of grounding from it. So I'm glad that now that you told me, I'm sorry that you're late on your call. So we can always, okay. do, we can finish some other time, but I, or not even finish some other time. We've done, a, you've gave us a lot of amazing information and um, where do people find you or get your book or just, you know, kind of sum it all up for me and you can then do your do your business later, like in about 30 <laughs> seconds. Totally. Jen, I just want to thank you for having me on, number one, and just for like your podcast is awesome. You bring so much hope to people and you give so much people inspiration and uh, like just the belief in themselves because me and you, we're not like we don't come from anything special, but we're able to create it through just the way we live and our habits. So being able to follow you from afar and see what you do, it's like, it's like it's awesome to call you a friend. And I would love to have you back on my podcast when the book comes out. But for myself, davidnurse.com, I do group coaching on there. Uh, social media is David Nurse NBA. Podcast is now called The Art Of. The Art Of, that has since changed. And anywhere books are found, go support. Is it called The Art Of what? Just The Art Of? The Art Of. And then you bring on all these amazing people. Like we had Boris Kojo, The Art Of Acting, or an NBA player was The Art Of Three-Point Shooting, where these people are obsessed in their passion, kind of like we talked about. Mm, I like it. Because uh, when I was on your podcast, it was called Pivot and Go. You changed it like in the last couple I months. Think it I guess. Was the final episode of Pivot and Go before we pivoted to whatever name. I love that. Amazing. Okay, great. And so that's all great. Uh, your book is great through the other one's called Pivot and Go. I really enjoy both of those books. I really enjoy talking to you. We're going to do this again super soon. Awesome. And in person, on the woodways. On the woodways. Yes, on the treadmills for sure. And uh, that's it. Thank you so much. I'll speak. Well, that's it, guys. Go go check him out. He's great. And thank you, David. I appreciate it. Thanks, Jen. Thank you so much. Thank you for watching Habits and Hustle. 
Please watch another video here and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already by pressing the button below. Hosted by Jennifer Cohen, visionaries tune in, you can get to know them. Be inspired, this is your moment. Excuses, we ain't having that. The Habits and Hustle Podcast, powered by Habit Nest.